Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 92, The Seleucid Empire, Magnesia. With the conclusion of the Fifth Syrian War and the marriage between Cleopatra and Ptolemy V secured, Antiochus III was positioned at the gates of Europe by 195. Between 195 to 192, Antiochus continued to launch expeditions into Thrace and the surrounding areas. The newly built Lysimachia was given to his son Seleucus to rule from as viceroy in the western satrapies, but 194 saw the king seize territory from the Thracians on the European side of the Bosphorus, thus liberating the Greeks living under their rule. This was also in the interest of Byzantium, which controlled much of the axis from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean, and were under threat from Thracian attacks. Galatia, too, was brought under heel through a combination of gifts and saber-rattling. In addition to his dealings with Ptolemy, Antiochus busied himself by playing royal matchmaker with his other children. His daughter Antiochus was wed to Arirathes IV of Cappadocia, and he extended an invitation to have Eumenes II of Pergamon marry his other daughter. In a novel move for the dynasty, the king ordered that Prince Antiochus and Princess Laodike were to be wed to one another. While King Antiochus and Queen Laodike were often referred to as siblings in royal propaganda, this was the actual first brother-sister marriage in the family's history, and the newlywed couple would produce a daughter named Nisa shortly thereafterwards. Antiochus' success in diplomacy and warfare only reaffirmed his role as the most powerful king in Asia, but this period was also quite politically tense. Since the Conference of Lysimachia in 196, the Seleucid Empire and the Roman Republic, the two dominant powers of the Mediterranean world, were now in a proverbial cold war. Each side had different perspectives. For Antiochus, Greece was to be the buffer between his empire and the Republic. Rome, on the other hand, believed that Antiochus should be contained to Asia, that the Greek cities were to be under their protection. Roman troops officially evacuated Greece in 194, as per the initiative put in place by Flamininus but they were not willing to leave it vulnerable to further chaos. Scipio Africanus, the conqueror of Carthage, gave a speech to the Senate earlier that year regarding the allocation of provinces for the incoming consulship. He spoke of a great war with Antiochus looming over the horizon, urged on by the Aetolians and other malcontents with grudges against the Republic. He argued against the withdrawal of troops from Greece and offered to serve as consul in Macedonia to contend against the Syrian king. The Senate evidently did not agree with him, and Scipio had to settle with a second consulship in Italy while the evacuation continued as planned. Goodwill, not a permanent occupation, was the way to win the hearts and minds of the Greeks, at least from Flamininus' point of view. But factions in Rome pushing for war clearly existed, and had some major supporters. In the winter of 194-193, Rome received embassies from several Greek cities, including one from Antiochus. Headed by the officials Hegesianax and Menippus, they gained an audience with Flamininus to discuss the possibility of friendship between the king and the republic. Menippus spoke first about the various types of agreements between nations, explaining how Rome and Antiochus had never been at war, nor had they done any harm to each other. It was therefore out of order for the republic to impose such rules and act as if they were the conquerors over the conquered, citing their treatment of Philip as a recent example. Flamininus shut down the perceived lecture on diplomacy and bluntly reaffirmed the Roman position. Antiochus must stay out of Europe entirely if he wanted them to remain out of Asia. And if the king ignored this demand, then the Romans had every right to defend the allied Greek cities in both Europe and Asia. Hegesianax snorted at the idea declaring that Antiochus had the right to retake the cities of Thrace and the Chersonesus as per Seleucus' defeat of Lysimachus at Choropedium in 281, and he was the one to rebuild the long-destroyed capital at great expense. To give up these Spear I territories would be both humiliating and unjust. The consul disagreed. The Seleucids had long neglected the region and allowed it to fall into ruin, while the Romans were obligated to safeguard the liberty of the Asiatic Greeks, and would not allow Antiochus to enslave them. One of the Roman commissioners interrupted the response of Hegesianax, demanding that he agree to Flamininus' conditions 
or leave without Rome's friendship. The Seleucid officials acknowledged that they could not make such a decision without the king's approval, but were terrified when Flamininus summoned all of the Greek embassies into the Senate floor, relayed their demands against Antiochus, and urged them to remain steadfast. Rome would secure their freedom much as they had done with the Greek cities under Philip's yoke. In contrast to the Lysimachean conference, Flamininus had now declared Rome's willingness to intervene militarily against Antiochus, an open display of her loyalty to the Greek allies. Word from Carthage also brought ill tidings. Hannibal Barca was now in the Seleucid court. It has been quite a while since we talked about our Punic friend, so a recap may be in order. In the aftermath of the Second Punic War, Hannibal had been responsible for overseeing the restoration of Carthage and assisting in the payments to the Republic as per the terms of their surrender. The Senate was still quite angry over all the damage he inflicted in Italy, and eventually demanded his surrender in 196-195. Hannibal instead took flight under the cover of darkness and sailed to Tyre for refuge. Tyre was the mother city of Carthage, but it was also under Seleucid control. Evidently, the Barcid was able to gain the audience of the king and offered his services as an advisor, which Antiochus accepted. Hannibal's new employment was deeply concerning to the Senate, fearing that he would try to incite war. According to Roman historians, Hannibal advised the king that a campaign in Greece would be futile, since the Republic would have endless supplies and manpower to ship across the Adriatic. The best course of action would be an invasion of Italy, and all Hannibal would need is 10,000 men, which would be enough to convince his remaining allies in Carthage to rebel against Roman authority. While it seemed that outside forces were driving the two great nations closer to open conflict, diplomacy was still viewed as a possible option. Three Roman delegates sailed to Asia intent on meeting with Antiochus, but first stopped at Pergamon to visit Eumenes, who expressed his wish to renew the friendship that was set up during the reign of his father, Attalus. Apparently, the Pergamene king rejected the marriage proposal from Antiochus, based on the belief that if the two powers fought, then the Republic would emerge victorious. As such, he pushed the Romans to take up arms against the Syrian king, eager to reap the benefits and protect himself from Antiochus' eventual retaliation. The delegation then headed south to the city of Ephesus, where Antiochus had been overseeing many of his operations from over the last decade. Since the king was out on campaign in Pisidia, the Romans settled for meeting with the Seleucid delegates. According to tradition, it is during this time that Scipio Africanus and Hannibal Barca came face to face with one another, both having been part of the respective parties. Amidst one of their conversations, Africanus quizzed Hannibal on whom he believed to be the greatest generals of all time, clearly hoping to hear the praises of his former adversary. The Barcid commander replied that Alexander the Great and Pyrrhus of Epirus were both first and second, but named himself as third. Scipio smiled, and asked if he would change his opinion if he had won the Battle of Zama instead, and Hannibal acknowledged that if he did win, then he would have been the greatest of all. It's a fantastic story, and one must suppose that, if it isn't true, it might as well ought to be. From Ephesus, the Roman commissioners went to the city of Apamea in Phrygia, hoping to finally meet with Antiochus who was residing there. However, the Apamean negotiations took a tragic turn for the king when a message arrived from Syria. The crown prince Antiochus had suddenly died. This was shocking given that he was only 28 years of age, though Livy intimates a story that King Antiochus ordered his son poisoned by eunuchs, reasoning that the prince was a threat to his authority on account of being in the prime of his life compared to the now weathered monarch. He tries to double down on this claim by pointing out that Antiochus had not been banished to a distant capital like Seleucus and Lysimachia, leaving few options but murder. While we know very little about the younger Antiochus, Livy's claim is, frankly, ridiculous. Antiochus the son had been ruling as joint king since roughly 210, with his name appearing several times alongside that of his father on royal documents and inscriptions. This was the prince who led the cataphracts against the Ptolemaic forces at Panium, and had been married to his sister Laodike a few years prior in an elaborate ceremony, as I mentioned earlier. He was highly respected by the members of the court, and had a great deal of trust placed into him by Antiochus III, so it seems quite absurd that the prince's death would have been remotely in the king's interest. Poison can be easily explained away by the ravages of disease like typhus or malaria. 
Livy even admits that Antiochus fell into a period of deep mourning upon hearing the loss of his son, which is a completely understandable reaction. With the king having returned to Syria to oversee the funeral rites, a Seleucid official named Minio met with the Romans at Ephesus to speak on his behalf. Much of the same back and forth took place as previous conferences, and the discussion ended without any real progress being made. Antiochus eventually returned to Ephesus and held a meeting with his council, the majority of which advocated going to war, but the king simply acknowledged their concerns and continued on with his business. However, one group was particularly emphatic in their support for a Roman Seleucid conflict, the Aetolian League. The Aetolians were part of the coalition that defeated Philip V in the Second Macedonian War, but their relationship with Rome deteriorated almost immediately afterwards. Feeling betrayed by Flamininus, who denied them territory and plunder, the Aetolians stoked anti-Roman sentiments in the interwar period. In 193, the Aetolian strategos named Thoas dispatched several officials to Antiochus, Nabus of Sparta, and Philip V in Macedonia. To the Spartan and Macedonian kings, they spoke of the injustices laid out by Rome against them, how Sparta was being lorded over by the Achaeans, and extolled the past virtues of Macedonia's rulers to incite him to join an alliance, especially with Hannibal Barca in the service of the Seleucids. For Antiochus, the Aetolians claimed to be the true architects of the victory over Philip, promising to supply him with men and fortresses. They also lied about having already secured the aid of both Nabus and Philip should Antiochus march into Greece. Ever the Achaean patriot, Polybius openly blamed the Aetolians for the war between Rome and Antiochus, though the Seleucid king did not seem impressed at this first meeting. However, King Nabus had responded positively to the Aetolian delegation and began to see cities along the coastline, something that was specifically forbidden in 195 following his submission to Rome and placed the important Laconian seaport of Githaeum under siege. The infuriated Achaeans sent representatives to Rome and seek counsel with Flamininus, chomping at the bit to relieve the defenders of Githaeum and put Nabus down. But Flamininus advised that the Achaeans hold off from making any sudden moves until the Romans managed to bring a fleet into the Peloponnese. Philippoamen, who had spent the period from 199 to 193 in Crete, had just returned to Achaea and was elected strategos for the fourth time. While he shared the Romans' opinion, he ultimately chose to reject it and invade Laconia in the summer of 192. Spartan Achaean ships fought off the coastline with Nabus' captains leaving the victors, but a land campaign that delivered a night victory over the Lacedaemonians sent them scurrying. Nabus was driven back to Sparta in terror while the Achaeans ravaged the countryside for about a month, until the arrival of Roman and Pergamene ships put an end to the fighting as Flamininus drew up yet another truce between the Republic and the Spartan king. At the time this was all taking place, Flamininus and a Roman commission was touring Greece to try and confirm the loyalty of the Athenians, Chalcidians, Demetrians, and Thessalians, the last of whom were recently separated from Macedonia. Thessaly was rather split in terms of its loyalties to Rome and Aetolia, with the current head Yuri Locus leaning in favor of the latter. After a passion speech, the pro-Roman faction overthrew Eurylochus on Flamininus' approval and sent him back to Aetolia. When this official reached the League's headquarters, his arrival was precipitated by Thoas and the Seleucid ambassador Menippus. Though Antiochus did not respond to the first delegation with much enthusiasm, a second visit had convinced him to send one of his own ambassadors back to Aetolia. Thoas bragged to the council about the sheer might of Antiochus' European army and the wealth that he had brought along with him, fanning the enthusiasm of the Pan-Atolian assembly about throwing their lot in with the Seleucids. An Athenian delegation reported this to Flamininus, who journeyed to Aetolia and tried in vain to remind the League of their allegiance to the Romans. But the hatred of the Aetolians for the man who denied them their glory overwhelmed Flamininus' words with the calls for war. One of the League officials named Democritus even had the audacity to threaten Flamininus that negotiations with the Republic would only take place from an Aetolian camp on the banks of the Tiber River. With the decision made, they would now formally invite Antiochus to come into Greece to arbitrate on their behalf. The energy after the conference convinced Thoas that a more drastic step needed to be taken. He set in motion a series of plots to send agents throughout Greece and overthrow the leading officials of key strongholds. 
In Demetrius, Aetolian troops snuck their way into the city and murdered the pro-Roman faction. Chalkis fared better, having caught wind of the plot ahead of the incoming forces, and were adequately prepared as they waited for Roman protection. The last targeted city was Sparta. Nabus's use had come to an end, and the Aetolian commander Alexamenos entered the city with an armed body of a thousand men under the pretense that they were coming to provide aid. During a training exercise, Alexamenos and the Aetolians were able to separate Nabus from his bodyguards and stabbed him to death, killing the last king of an independent Sparta. This wasn't known at the time, and the infuriated Spartans wreaked vengeance upon the murderers, who had busied themselves by raiding Nabus's treasury. The Aetolian commander and his men were slaughtered or sold into slavery, and while the Lacedaemonians tried to appoint a royal boy named Laconicus to the throne, outside forces would bring Spartan independence to an end once and for all. Word of the upheaval made its way to Philippoemen, who leapt at the opportunity to neuter their longtime adversary. An Achaean army entered the city, and Philippoemen spoke with the leading citizens to secure their incorporations into the League. The activities of the Aetolians and Achaeans had created a firestorm, and Flamininus raced around Greece to put them out. Such chaos was becoming apparent to the Senate, who authorized the enrollment of 25,000 troops to send across the Adriatic and stay in Illyria. Antiochus, meanwhile, had been busy in the summer of 192 trying to win the alliance of Troas, Smyrna, and Lamsacus in Asia Minor. The king had been keeping watch of the breakdown of negotiations in Greece, and by now had received the petition by the Aetolians to arbitrate between them and Rome. Livy suggests that the capture of Demetrius was also a major step to the king's planning, and the time seemed ripe for a decision. In September of 192, Antiochus III sailed into Euboea with 10,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and six elephants in tow, only after making a pit stop in Troy to offer sacrifices to Athena for a blessing over his expedition. Livy makes it clear that this was not enough of a force to contend with Rome, so it is likely that Antiochus banked on using the Aetolians and their promised support, and it may very well have been an attempt to respond to the legions that were now stationed in Illyria. The king landed in Demetrius and marched to the Aetolian city of Lamia. Welcomed by crowds of cheering citizens, Antiochus gave a speech announcing that he had come on behalf of the Aetolians, and though his current force was a token one, he fully intended on summoning his armies from Asia in the spring of 191, unless the Romans promised to remove their yoke from the neck of Greece. The league officials then voted to make Antiochus their strategos, and promised to supply him with whatever he needed. Antiochus tried to convince the Chalcidians to defect from the Romans, and to the Achaeans he sent a messenger asking them for their neutrality in the upcoming war. Neither were willing to betray Rome, and the League made sure to send extra reinforcements to Chalkis. With diplomacy having failed, the King decided that force was now necessary. A three-pronged invasion of Euboea was ordered, with Antiochus leading the bulk of his army against Chalkis and his fleets providing support. Another 3,000 men were given to Menippus to attack the temple city of Delium. Though staffed with Roman, Achaean, and Pergamene troops, these men were caught unawares by the Seleucid forces since war had not been formally declared. Most of the Romans were massacred as they were out foraging, and the rest of the defenders fled for safety. Soon the key fortresses dotting Euboea were captured, the pro-Roman party in Chalcis was forced to leave, and Antiochus was now in command of the region, his first major stronghold in Greece. For the most part, the years preceding the outbreak of war show that both Antiochus and Rome had demonstrated little interest in launching full-scale conflict. The willingness of the Republic to withdraw from Greece despite their concerns serves as the single biggest piece of evidence supporting this, in my opinion anyways, but it is worth pointing out that Antiochus was at least open to engage in several conferences to rehash the issue without immediately resorting to violence. The largest problem, I believe, were their mission statements. Rome would not fall back on its expressed purpose from the Ismian Declaration and protecting the freedom of the Greeks, whereas Antiochus was abiding by the long-established tradition of spear one land and dynastic claims. This left him in a bind when it came to compromising, but perhaps the situation would not have escalated if it were not for the actions of the regional powers, Eumenes of Pergamon, the Achaean League, the Aetolian League, Hannibal Barca, and Nabus of Sparta, 
all consciously fanned the flames that would push them into conflict. Rome's mission to maintain lasting peace in Greece ended in failure. For the removal of Macedon as the premier hegemon left many looking to settle grudges both old and new, in addition to the fierce competition for power that took place. It must be noted though that Antiochus had made the ultimate decision to make a crossing into Greece with an army, one that had no hopes of conquering the entirety of Greece alone, mind you, whereas Rome made no such move in Asia. A promise of military support from Aetolia and the false reports of his popularity were enough to convince him to undertake this endeavor, and I think Antiochus was foolish if he believed the Republic would not retaliate, otherwise he was planning for further conflict. The dead legionaries of Delium were the first victims of the conflict, and now the Romans were left with no choice but to devote their full attention to the king. If there was to be war, so be it. Following Antiochus' conquest of Euboea, the king used the momentum of his victory to try and secure the allegiance of more city-states throughout Greece in late 192. Epirus was unwilling to commit to either Rome or the Seleucid ruler, but the Eleans were looking to join his cause to protect themselves against their Achaean rivals, and King Amenander of Athamania also switched sides after previously allying with Rome in the war against Philip, having already promised his brother-in-law the throne of Macedonia once taken. So too did the peoples of Boeotia, and the citizens of Thebes gave a warm welcome to the king's entourage. The Boeotians had not forgiven the Republic for the assassination of the pro-Macedonian Bracales in early 196, which almost escalated into a rebellion and declaration of war against the League by Flamininus, so there was no love lost between the two. A council was then summoned to Demetrius to decide the next course of action for the war, Parts of the Peloponnese and central Greece were under the king's authority, but the question of places like Thessaly were still left to debate. Hannibal Barca proposed a plan which emphasized an alliance between Philip V and Antiochus and another Italian invasion. These recommendations were flatly ignored by the king, who chose to attack Thessaly and was able to capture the cities of Ferrai and Scotusa. His unsuccessful siege of Larissa was driven off, but the Athamanians laid waste to the northern regions of the country. Given Hannibal's past success against the Romans and reputation as a tactical genius, some have questioned Antiochus' repeated refusal to give him a substantial position of command or follow his advice. The most Hannibal would ever get to lead in this war was a naval battle. While jealousy on the part of Antiochus has been suggested, it was not a realistic proposition to begin with. As king, it would have been in poor form to hand such a high degree of authority over to someone outside of the royal family a non-Greek no less. It is also worth pointing out that Hannibal had ultimately lost the Second Punic War. His insights would certainly be appreciated, but Antiochus was an experienced commander with impressive victories under his belt. The pattern of wise advisor rejected by the arrogant king is an oft-repeated one in classical texts, so it is unknown how much influence Hannibal held sway in the Seleucid court to begin with. News of Antiochus' attacks quickly made its way to the Senate House in Rome. With the bloodshed at Delium, the Republic felt entirely justified in the formal declaration of war against the Seleucid Empire. Currently, there were 25,000 Roman soldiers in Illyria under the command of the praetor Marcus Babius Tamphilus. But the newly elected consul of 191, Manius Acilius Calabrio, was appointed to oversee the war and bring another 10,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, and 15 elephants as reinforcements. They were not going to arrive until the following spring, but Roman agents were already beginning to make their counterattacks, starting with Macedonia. Ever since the Peace of Naupactus, King Philip V sat quietly watching events unfold as he tried to rebuild his kingdom under the pressure of the indemnity placed upon him and the loss of his soldiers during the war. He did not respond to the Aetolian delegation of 193, no doubt annoyed by the appeals from such a long-time foe but the Senate had approached him during the build-up to the conflict with Antiochus. Concerned about the Antigone king's loyalty, they offered to release him from his indemnity early and return Prince Demetrius back to Macedon if he kept to the treaty. Meanwhile, the Seleucid court was grossly ill-advised by Thoas of Philip's willingness to take up arms against Rome. 
and Antiochus even took it upon himself to oversee the burial of the bones of the dead Macedonian troops that littered the battlefield of Kangos Kephali. It is not clear why they were left untouched in the first place. There is no explicit evidence that the Romans prohibited Philip from doing so, but Antiochus's intentions are questionable. He may have tried to do it as a goodwill gesture towards Philip, hoping to persuade his fellow sovereign to betray the Romans. This ended up backfiring, and the Antigone was furious because this was a task reserved for the king of Macedonia, meaning that Antiochus, perhaps deliberately, undermined his authority to win over the loyalty of the Macedonians. Philip ended up doubling down and lent his aid to Rome, sending a messenger alerting Babius that Antiochus had breached Thessaly. He also issued a message to the Senate, offering to make an early payment on his indemnity, along with supporting troops. But the Senate politely refused the cash and asked him to assist the praetor when requested. By pretending to have gathered the bulk of their manpower, Babius and Philip were able to scare off the Seleucid force besieging Larissa, much to the relief of its citizens, and so they returned to their quarters in Macedonia to finish out the rest of the season. The winter of 192-191 also bore witness to a curious episode. Antiochus and his court spent time in Chalcis, but during his stay, the king was said to have fallen in love with a Chalcidian noblewoman and married her, giving her the name Eubea. Festivals were held and his troops were allowed to partake in the celebrations. Our ancient sources consider the whole affair to be an act of wanton decadence and lust on the king's part, considering the behavior unfit for both his age and especially the war he was now overseeing, and the professional discipline of the army eroded away due to the festivities. The Eubea affair strikes me as a case of literary embellishment to help explain the outcome of the war, but there are a few points to mention. As we recall, Antiochus was long married to Laodike III, and while the practice of polygamy within the dynasty's history is murky, it is quite likely that Laodike had died not long after Prince Antiochus. An inscription of 193 lists a proclamation to establish a cult in her honor, which normally takes place after the recipient died. I cannot help but sympathize with Antiochus if he lost his wife and eldest son in such a short span of time, but in pragmatic terms, remarrying would fill the hole in the imperial family left behind in the former queen's absence. Being wedded to Eubea was also a way to cement the dynasty's ties, or claims, to Greece proper, and the choice to rename the bride after the first island conquered by Antiochus must have carried greater symbolic meaning. In the spring, Antiochus made a sacrifice to Apollo in Delphi and descended into Acarnania along the southwestern coastline of Greece. With help on the inside, he was able to surprise the defenders and make his way into Medion unopposed, hoping to deny the Romans the chance of a landing zone for their fleet. This was about as far as he got in the region before news spread announcing the arrival of the consul Glabrio and his army in March, who made landfall in Illyria. Babius and Philip spent the beginning of the season recapturing territory in Thessaly that had been taken by Antiochus, while Glabrio made his way into the area and linked up with the pair. Some of the garrisons were staffed with Athamanians, and 3,000 were taken captive by Philip. By offering a bit of clemency, the Antigonid ruler managed to incorporate the territory of the Athamanians into his own kingdom, driving King Amenander and his family into Ambracia. Now the combined army were able to head into southern Thessaly, stopping just north of the mountain pass bordering Lamia. In only a few short months, much of Antiochus' gains were now lost. He was furious with the Aetolians for their terrible advice, and demanded that the entirety of their fighting force to offer their service to the war effort. Only about 4,000 were able to show up, the rest still in Aetolia waiting for the Roman retribution. The hope for reinforcements from Asia was ebbing away with each passing day and it soon became clear that he was going to be left facing the brunt of the Romano-Macedonian coalition with what relatively little manpower he had, which numbered around 10,000 infantry and 500 cavalrymen, along with the Aetolian reinforcements. Rome, on the other hand, was working with about 40,000 infantry, 3,500 cavalry, and some elephants. Antiochus was going to have to rely on the geography to work in his favor, for if the Romans were going to make their approach into Lamia, the only way to do so would be through the pass of Thermopylae. Little introduction needs to be given, for the story of Leonidas' last stand at Thermopylae against the Persian army in 480, and to a lesser extent the Greek coalition against Brennus and his Celts in 279, 
was as well known to the Greeks and Romans as it is to us in the modern day. They were equally aware of the hidden paths that could enable the attacking army to outflank the defenders. Antiochus decided to improve his odds by building an impressive series of fortifications consisting of a double rampart, ditch, and stone wall that could deter anyone approaching along the pass. He also entrusted the Aetolians to cover his flank, with 2,000 of them stationed in various groups throughout the heights, lest the same fate befall him like it did for the Spartans. The remaining 2,000 were to garrison the city of Heraclea that lay just before the pass, hoping that the consul would tie himself down in a siege. Antiochus' aims are not entirely clear. Perhaps he was hoping to stall for time to allow his reinforcements to come from Asia Minor, but the position he took would at least provide a bit of protection and stall the enemy advance. Unfortunately, Glabrio ended up ignoring Heraclea in favor of a more direct approach against the defenses. Antiochus placed his phalangites in front of the ramparts, supported by his missile troops. When the Romans pressed forward, the pikemen were able to head back into the ramparts and use their elevated position to thrust downwards at the attacking Romans, many of who were gored as soon as they bravely threw themselves at the Seleucid line. This was working well enough, but soon Antiochus heard shouting behind him. During the war, one Marcus Portius Cato, better known as Cato the Elder, was serving as tribune for Glabrio. In the night before the attack, he was ordered along with his co-tribune Lucius Valerius to lead a detachment to flush out the Aetolians hiding along the peaks. Cato was able to ambush one of these encampments and learned from one of his captives the route behind the Seleucid army. Many in the king's camp believed the incoming troops to be Aetolians, but soon realized that the enemy had surrounded them. Panic broke the Seleucid army, who fled the scene as best as they could. During the chaos, Antiochus took a slingstone to the face and had several of his teeth knocked out. For those that remember, he also lost several teeth to a blow to the mouth he suffered at the Arius River in 208, so his dental health must have been atrocious by this point. Bloodied and beaten, the king gathered his horse and raised off with 500 of his royal guards to Elatea. From there, he fled to Chalkis and sailed back to Asia Minor in shame. Many of the 10,000 troops Antiochus brought with him to Europe were now dead or captured, while Thermopylae now belonged to the Romans, who only lost a few hundred in the battle. Antiochus' adventure in Europe was now at an end, and he had retired to Asia in order to lick his wounds. After rounding up the survivors, Glabrio pushed forward into Boeotia, whose inhabitants dreaded the fate that potentially awaited them for siding with the king. The consul opted for clemency, choosing not to let his troops plunder the rebellious cities and merely berated them for their behavior. Chalcus was relieved of its Seleucid leadership, and the citizens threw open the gates in complete support of the Romans, while Cato returned to Rome to deliver the good news. Glabrio's authority as consul was restricted to Greece, and so he could not pursue the king in Asia, but he could turn his attention to the Aetolians who were left behind. Heraclea was put under siege immediately, and for almost a month the garrison inside held out against the battering of Roman siege equipment before surrendering. Democritus, the same individual who threatened to bring war to the banks of the Tiber, was captured and put in chains. Having not been present at the Battle of Thermopylae under the pretense that he was suffering from illness, King Philip was busy besieging the city of Lamia at the same time. A sort of race between the Romans and Macedonians was taking place, as each tried to capture their respective cities first, but when word of Heraclea's fall was announced, he was forced to retire from his siege and let the Romans claim their prize. Back in Atolia, the League was trying to find some way out of the mess they helped create. Thoas dispatched messengers to the court of Antiochus demanding his aid. Not only was he bound by oath to protect them, but the longer they were able to hold out, then the more time he had to regroup and prepare for the Roman invasion of Asia. The king acknowledged the rationale and sent a gift of cash to try and help the situation. By the time his gifts were on their way, though, Heracli had fallen already and the Aetolians sent ambassadors to Glabrio begging for peace. With their attempts to point to their past alliances falling upon deaf ears, 
The consul demanded they surrender completely, offering a ten-day armistice for them to decide. But one of the Aetolians protested the terms, citing that they were neither Greek nor just. In a display of supreme authority, or arrogance, Glabrio mocked the attempt to dictate what was fair or just, and slapped iron collars around the ambassadors' necks. This was coarse behavior even from the point of view of the Roman tribunes, and the Aetolians were released back into their country to make a final decision. While they wavered in action, news of Antiochus' support and the anger over their recent treatment inspired the Aetolians to let the armistice lapse and continue to pursue war. Glabrio pushed forward and laid siege to Aetolian settlements, but the arrival of Flamininus put a hold in the situation. Though the Aetolians had insulted his honor, the champion of the Greeks had taken pity after they supplicated to him for mercy, and Glabrio was forced to offer a truce of a few months. The consul's term was also on the verge of expiring and being handed over to his successor. Lucius Cornelius Scipio, brother of Scipio Africanus, was elected one of the two consuls for 190 and assigned the territory of Greece. Unlike Glabrio, Lucius was also given the ability to continue the war in Asia, so long as Scipio Africanus accompanied him to serve as legate, along with another 8,000 infantry and 300 cavalry for reinforcements. The Senate was concerned that a potential rematch with Hannibal Barca was incoming. Who else but the hero of Zama should be enough to deal with them? Africanus was the more experienced brother and would take the forefront if things went south. But a rematch would end up not taking place, and the defense of Asia was almost entirely overseen by Antiochus. The king had retreated to Ephesus following his defeat at Thermopylae, hoping that Rome would not pursue him following his escape from Greece. Hannibal explained to his majesty that the Republic had no intentions to end their pursuit and would be sailing from Europe to Asia with an army following in only a matter of months. Roman ships under the command of one Aulus Attilia sank a number of Seleucid vessels during the king's flight from Europe, and now the new commander, Gaius Livius Salinator, was en route with a fleet of 88 ships just past Delos, heading into the Aegean. Antiochus assigned the responsibility to confront the incoming force to his naval commander, Polyxenidas, who was confident that his sailors were far greater in skill than that of the Romans. This overconfidence came back to bite him, as the Romans were joined also by ships from Rhodes and Pergamon and the engagement sent Polyxenidas back to Ephesus in defeat. Salinator was able to follow Eumenes back into his territory, and made landfall in Iolis, setting up camp in the Pergamene kingdom for the winter of 191-190. to As the Scipios went about enrolling the new legionaries in Italy, Antiochus was equally busy in his efforts to shore up defenses. Hannibal was sent to Phoenicia to gather more sailors and ships. Polyxenidas refitted the ones already in his arsenal, and a recruitment drive in Galatia was able to supplement his infantry with some of the toughest warriors available. The ultimate goal was to try and prevent the Romans from making a crossing at the Hellespont, and so he fortified the cities of Cestus and Abydus. Having been in exile from Rhodes himself, Polyxenidas was also able to inflict a defeat on the Rhodian fleet by tricking one of the commanders as a false turncoat. Yet for all their efforts, the Seleucid commander was not able to contend with the substantially larger Roman navy that was making its approach, now under the control of Lucius Aemilius Regulus, and Ephesus was soon placed under a blockade. Prince Seleucus, the new heir to the throne, was dispatched with an army to Iolis in order to ravage the countryside of Pergamon and harass the Roman encampment stationed nearby. Eumenes was the Republic's most important ally in Asia, so it was essential that Adelaide resources be denied to the legions. Throughout the winter, he first put the port city of Alea to siege, but then moved on to Pergamon following the arrival of Antiochus with most of his army. Seleucid troops pillaged the farmlands, but made no decisive attack on the Pergamene Acropolis. Antiochus tried to pressure Eumenes and the Roman garrison in the city to come to the negotiating table, but they all rejected the offer in favor of holding out until the Roman invasion. This raiding took over much of the spring, but outside of some plunder, it achieved few objectives. As the Allied fleet continued their blockade of Ephesus from their base at Samos, messengers brought word of Hannibal and his newly acquired ships sailing from Syria. The Rhodians departed to protect their home city against the Carthaginians' approach. A battle was fought off the coastline of Sidae, the modern province of Antalya, 
and while Barca was an incredible tactician on land, he was far less adept on the sea. His larger navy was outmaneuvered by the skill of the Rhodians, and was unable to rendezvous with the king's forces in the Aegean. Regardless, Polyxenidas was still in command of 89 vessels, whereas Regulus only had about 80, 22 of them being Rhodian ships. In September of 190, Antiochus attacked the city of Notion in an effort to draw out the Roman fleet away from Samos, bound by treaty to protect their new ally. Polyxenidas then escaped Ephesus and pursued Regulus, confronting him at the promontory of Myonesus in an ambush. Caught off guard, but still managing to pull the army together, the Romans were able to smash through the Seleucid line as the Rhodians attacked from the flank in a skillful display of nautical expertise. Almost half of Polyxenidas' fleet was destroyed or captured at the cost of three allied ships, a bargain by any standard. The battles of Myonesus and Sede spelled the end of Antiochus' control over the Aegean Sea, and so the Roman march from Greece to Asia was inevitable. Despondent over his loss, Antiochus chose to evacuate the garrison stationed along the Chersonesus and in Lysimachia, which seems rather odd since the city was so well fortified that it would have disrupted the Roman advance. An attempt was made to recruit King Prusius of Bithynia, who controlled the Asian side of the Bosphorus. A letter from the Scipio brothers reminded Prusius of their fair treatment towards other rulers, and the Bithynian monarch closed his doors to any further discussions with Antiochus. By the early autumn of 190, the Scipio brothers made their way across the Hellespont, having encountered almost zero Seleucid defenders. Not counting the crew stationed in Aeolus, this was the first time a Roman army crossed into Asia. They could hardly have imagined that there would be still Roman armies here nearly one and a half thousand years later. The journey was made far easier thanks to the efforts of Philip V, who rebuilt many of the bridges and safeguarded their passage through Thrace against attacks from opportunistic raiders. Lysimachia was taken without much trouble, and its well-stocked provisions were reappropriated for the Roman cause. At this point, Scipio Africanus had stalled the march deeper into Asia for a religious ceremony he was obligated to oversee, but he was met by an emissary named Heraclides of Byzantium on behalf of Antiochus. Rather than approaching his brother, the king was hoping to directly appeal to Scipio, banking on the idea that he was not hungry for glory after his victories in Spain and Africa, and therefore would be open to negotiation. On top of this, Scipio's own son had been captured by Seleucid patrols, and could be used as leverage. A council was held where the ambassador read Antiochus' offer. In return for peace, the king would give up his claims over Smyrna, Lampsacus, and Alexandria Troas, along with any Ionian cities that had gone to the Roman side. He would also pay for half the costs of the war, and since he evacuated Lysimachia along with the rest of his European conquests, all the reasons that the Republic had threatened to go to war in the first place had been addressed. Fortunately for him, the time for reconciliation had long passed. The legions were already on Antiochus' doorstep, and would have forced his surrender of those territories already. The brothers demanded nothing less than all of his conquests in Asia Minor to protect the freedom of the Greek cities, and the prospect of Antiochus paying for only half the cost of the war was laughable considering he was the aggressor so a full payment was owed. Obviously, Heraclides could not accept these conditions, and privately tried to bribe Africanus with an enormous payment, and the promise of releasing his son without ransom. This proposition was also rejected, but credit to Antiochus is deserved, as he graciously released Scipio's son unharmed and well-treated even after the failure of the negotiations. Having made no progress, Heraclides returned to the Seleucid court, and the brothers prepared to march south to confront the king. A final showdown to determine who was going to be the master of the Hellenistic world was to take place, as all armies converged on the plains of Magnesia. In September of 2023, I made a trip to western Turkey and stayed in Izmir. From there, I was able to tour the countryside where the Battle of Magnesia was fought. The battlefield itself was on the plains sandwiched between the Hermus and Phrygios rivers, north of the city of Magnesia ad Sipilum, modern Manisa. 
while Mount Sipulus towers over the landscape in the southeast. The area itself offers a flat landscape that contrasts with the rolling hills surrounding it, which you need to wind through as you drive from village to village. This was prime real estate for both the deployment of the Pike Phalanx and the Seleucid Cavalry, something that was not in Philip V's favor at Kynos Kephali, and is where Antiochus brought his forces in preparation for the fight with Rome. The Romans moved south to Alea, where they were met with by Eumenes, who resupplied them and brought troops for the upcoming battle. When approaching from the north, the Roman army was encamped on the opposite side of the Phrygios River. Antiochus had fortified his position opposite the riverbank to compel the Romans to fight only on his conditions. Everyone expected Scipio Africanus to be leading the Roman army into battle, but he had taken ill and was unfit for duty, leaving his brother Lucius in charge. Out of appreciation for the return of his son, Scipio allegedly sent the king a message advising him not to fight unless his illness abated and he resumed command, but both sides were facing pressure. By now, it was late December of 190, or early January of 189. The legionaries had been conducting raids against the Seleucid camp, and feared that they would have to wait until the summertime to attack, lest the campaigning season come to an end. Antiochus, meanwhile, had been concerned about allowing the enemy raids to go unpunished, and making himself look weak. His hand was forced when the Romans crossed the Phrygios and deployed their battle line, and so the royal army was marched out of camp. We get a rich, albeit confusing, description of the troops that Antiochus had at Magnesia, summoned from all corners of the empire. 16,000 phalangites formed the center phalanx, measuring 32 men deep. Livy states that the phalanx was divided into 10 parts, each separated by two elephants, like towers along a rampart. An extremely unusual layout by the standards of Hellenistic warfare. On each side of the phalanx were 1,500 Galatian warriors to protect the vulnerable flanks of the phalangites. Antiochus took command of the right wing, which contained 3,000 cataphracts, 1,000 cavalrymen of the royal agema, an unknown number of silver shields acting outside of the phalanx, 1,200 horse archers of the Dahai, 3,000 light infantrymen from Crete and Thrace, 2,500 Mysian archers, 4,000 various Kertian and Elmayan infantry, and 16 elephants in reserve. Prince Seleucus would be overseeing the left, 2,000 Cappadocian infantry, 2,700 mixed auxiliaries, 3,000 additional cataphracts, 1,000 royal agama riders, Tarentine horsemen, 2,500 Galatian cavalry, 1,000 Cretan archers, 1,500 Carian and Cilician warriors, 1,500 Thracians, 4,000 Catrati skirmishers, and 4,000 additional Kertians and Mayans. An unknown number of Arabian archers riding camels were stationed in front of the left wing, as were the famous scythe chariots. As the name implies, these were visually quite a horrifying weapon to face. Four horses were decked out in heavy armor, not unlike those of the cataphracts, pulling an equally armored carriage. Blades were placed on the axles of each wheel, and multiple lances were attached to the harnesses of the horses. In theory, you end up with a weapon that could bisect, decapitate, trample, and impale your enemies in one neat little package. This was not the first time such a weapon was deployed in Greek warfare. Both Xenophon and Alexander faced off against them during their dealings in Persia, yet in both cases they failed spectacularly. Seleucus I had them in his army when Demetrius Polyarchides invaded Asia Minor, but this is the first instance that we know of where Antiochus deployed them. In total, the number of troops roughly approximates to 60,000 infantry and 12,000 cavalry, as per the sources. The passages of Livy and Appian describing the Seleucid army are not unlike the presentation of the Persian forces by Herodotus. Seleucid ambassadors bragged about the size and diversity of the king's troops, describing them as clouds of infantry and cavalry, containing men of unknown peoples from across the world. Flamininus is said to have downplayed the intended effect, by comparing it to seasonings used to disguise cheap meat. According to an anecdote reported by the Roman author Aulus Gellius, Antiochus presented this vast and highly decorated army to Hannibal, proudly asking the Carthaginian if he had brought enough for the Romans. Hannibal dryly responded, I think this will all be enough. Yes, quite enough for the Romans, even though they are most avaricious, and reduce the glittering Seleucid equipment as mere plunder to be taken in battle. The Romans on their part were no less eager to make it a decisive confrontation. Approaching from the north, 
Lucius Scipio arranged the Roman line following its traditional deployment. Four legions of Roman and Latin allies formed the center under the command of Lucius, approximately 20,000 men in total, following the traditional three lines of Hastati, Principes, and Triarii. To their right were 3,000 light infantry drawn from the Achaeans and Pergamenes, followed by 1,000 Cretan archers and Trallians. 3,000 Roman cavalrymen were stationed on the right wing, joined by an additional 800 Pergamene cavalry to be commanded by King Eumenes himself, joined by his brother Attalus as well. The left wing was substantially smaller in size, only about 120 cavalrymen who guarded the banks of the Hermos River. Lastly, a force of 2,000 Macedonian and Thracian volunteers were kept behind to guard the camp, along with 16 elephants. As per the sources, this would amount to roughly 30,000 men. It has been argued, quite reasonably in my opinion, that the number on the Roman side is substantially lower than what is presented to us by our source. For instance, it seems unlikely that Eumenes would contribute such a relatively small number of men for a battle that could determine the fate of his kingdom. Rather than 30,000, I think it's safe to say that we are probably looking more at 40,000 to 45,000 men in the Roman army. It is also likely that the Seleucid forces were blown up as well, and a more realistic figure can be reduced to 45,000 to 50,000 men. What is important to understand is that Antiochus outnumbered the Romans in terms of cavalry, clearly intending it to be the key to his victory, and that the diversity of troop types he brought was far greater than that of the Republic. On the morning of the battle, an overcast mist gave way to a drizzle on the plains. A chilly and uncomfortable start, but one that did not affect the equipment of the legionaries. The archers and slingers in the Seleucid ranks did not fare so well, their bowstrings and leather weakened by the moisture. With the line stretched out, Antiochus was unable to get a full view of the battlefield from the right wing, but he hoped that a charge of his scythe chariots on the left would terrorize the Roman line. On his orders, the charioteers drove forward, their spinning blades turning the already formidable vehicle into a diabolical combine, ready to harvest their human crops. However, Eumenes was well prepared to deal with such weaponry, ordering that his missile troops fire en masse at the incoming horses. The sheer number of rocks and arrows managed to get past even their heavily armored frames, and the pain drove the horses into a frenzy. The riders were unable to keep them under control, and the horses unwittingly turned back into their own left wing, shattering the formation of the cataphracts and camel riders as men and beast alike were mulched in a horrifying act of friendly fire. Sensing that the moment was right, Eumenes led his cavalry in a charge alongside the infantry against the disoriented Seleucid line. The cataphracts were weighed down by their armor and unable to avoid either the rogue chariots or the incoming Roman army. Many of the supporting units were terrified more so by the screams of their allies than the weight of the Pergamene king's advance and fled the battlefield. With the left wing in tatters and exposing the sides of the phalanx, the phalangites swiftly formed a large hollow square and allowed the lighter skirmishing units and elephants to take refuge inside. This gave the Seleucid troops breathing room as neither Roman legionary nor cavalryman was able to break through the wall of spearheads that impaled anyone bold enough to try and get past. But this also meant that the Phalangites were unable to march forward and risk openings in their formation. Such was the situation in the center, but the right wing found a bit more success. As the left wing had made its initial approach, Antiochus led his cavalry into the Roman left which was lacking in numbers due to their reliance on the protection of the river. The Seleucid charge overwhelmed the Romans, who fled back to their camp with the king's men in hot pursuit. As the rumbling of the incoming men and horses approached the camp, the defenders came out in full force. One of the tribunes guarding the area caught wind of the retreat, in order that any soldier who refused to fight was to be cut down. Now sufficiently motivated, the once fleeing Romans met head to head with the royal guard, but the blasting of trumpets and the cheering of men filled the scene as Attalus led a squadron of Pergamene cavalry to reinforce their line. Antiochus and his Agema panicked at the sudden rush of attackers, and upon seeing the collapse of the left wing, he and his men chose to flee the battlefield to avoid their destruction. Now, with the king gone and the left completely torn apart, the Phalangites tried to make an orderly retreat as the legionaries became more aggressive in their efforts to carve apart the phalanx. Javelins from the Roman infantry found their mark in the bodies of the pikemen, but the mass of spears was still a considerable threat to be reckoned with. 
Yet the missiles found greater success against the mounts seeking protection inside the square. Seleucid elephants and horses were unable to handle the barrage of enemy fire, and they too were driven mad, attempting to escape by trampling many of the unlucky phalangites in their path. The phalanx was now broken apart. The legionaries slaughtered or captured anyone they came across, and Eumenes led his cavalry to chase after the fleeing survivors, leaving the field in the hands of the Republic. So ended the Battle of Magnesia. It was a complete disaster for Antiochus. Livian Appian suggests that upwards of 53,000 Seleucid troops died, and 1,400 were captured in the engagement, with only 324 Romans and 25 Pergamines killed in action. A far more believable figure would significantly reduce those estimates to similar levels faced at the Battle of Raphia, but suffice it to say that the losses were devastating, and the king would not be able to continue the war against Rome while also keeping his empire secure. Magnesia is often cited as a prime example which demonstrated the tactical superiority of the Roman legion over the Macedonian pike phalanx, especially when you consider that the battlefield was well suited for the deployment of the phalangites. Yet as we have seen, the engagement was not decided by the flexibility of a legionary over a pikeman, or even the brilliant command of Lucius Scipio. If anyone was to deserve the lion's share of the credit, it ought to be Eumenes, whose decisive action turned the tide of the battle just as it started. We do not know what Antiochus' plan was, but the apparent reliance on heavy cavalry was not an unreasonable way to beat the Romans, yet it was his trust in the flasher units that turned out to be a key mistake, as the scythe chariots ended up causing a catastrophic breakdown in his left wing after Eumenes' generalship exploited them to his advantage. The Seleucid phalanx was then left exposed and forced to take a more defensive position, but it still was disciplined enough to form rank and remain a dangerous obstacle to the Romans, who were unable to get through head-on until the terrified elephants smashed their way out. Antiochus' refusal to stay on the battlefield caused the collapse in the army's morale, and, like at Raphia, he had been too eager in his cavalry charge to try and handle the breakdown that was happening under his watch. In the following years, Eumenes was eager to broadcast his role in the outcome of the battle. A now lost bronze plaque discovered in the excavations of Pergamon during the late 19th century depicts Eumenes' cavalry charge against the Seleucid forces, who are shown fighting against the Romans. Marble reliefs from the Sanctuary of Athena built during his reign depicts the spoils of war from his defeated enemies, including Seleucid cataphract armor, wheels from a chariot, and equipment from Antiochus's Galatian allies. The Achaean League also dedicated the statue to the Attalids, celebrating their alliance and joint triumph at Magnesia. For the Romans, the war with Antiochus was treated as their own version of the war between Greece and Persia, complete with a Thermopylae, a naval victory, and a final land battle. The historian Florus, writing in the late 1st, early 2nd century AD, delivers the comparison in no uncertain terms. Quote, Report never represented any war as formidable than this, as the Romans bethought them of the Persians and the East, of Xerxes and Darius, of the days when impassable mountains were said to have been cut through and the sea hidden with sails. Let not Athens be overproud. In Antiochus we defeated the Xerxes, in Aemilius Regulus, we had the equal of an Alcibiades. At Ephesus, we rivaled Salamis. End quote. Lucius Cornelius Scipio was also keen to bask in the glory of overseeing the final battle of the war. He was not an especially brilliant commander, and some theorize that Scipio Africanus' supposed illness on the day of the battle was really an attempt to allow his brother the chance to take command and claim the honor. In parallel to his brother's agnomen of Africanus, Lucius soon adopted the title Asiaticus, due to the Republic's first major victory on Asian soil. An epitaph found on the slab of a sarcophagus belonging to Lucius' son, who also bore the agnomen, proudly states how his father was the conqueror of Antiochus the Great. With the Battle of Magnesia concluded, let us bring this episode to an end. Next time we meet, we will discuss the terms that would be laid out to King Antiochus, which would steer the course of the Seleucid dynasty for the rest of its history.